There is only one real problem in the world, and it doesn't matter whether the desired accomplishment is managing a sports team, building a business, or running an empire. The problem is the same, leadership. Because of the tremendous consequences involved and outcomes that affect the lives of so many, the importance of leadership is immutable through the ages and highly relevant into the future. Welcome to the Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor. Now, here's your host, Tom Lindquist. You've entered the Leadership Lyceum. We'll bring you direct access to top CEOs and directors of boards in an interview format that provides insight on situational issues that confront CEOs every day. Think of it as a CEO's virtual mentor. Welcome to Episode 4 of the Leadership Lyceum. I'm delighted to feature Brian Shin, CEO of publicly traded U.S. Silica, on the program today. Brian and I sat down at the University Club of Chicago on May 18, 2016. As president and CEO, he set the company on a new strategic direction and transformed the company through an IPO to the delight of his private equity investors, Golden Gate Capital, during his first year as CEO. The timing of the IPO in early 2012 was predicated on the new strategic move for the company into high-growth oil and gas sector fracking applications for its products, which we know is a highly volatile environment, which we'll cover in greater detail in an upcoming part two of the interview. We'll be right back with an introduction to Brian Shen and his company, U.S. Silica. It's helpful to have a quick introduction to the company. U.S. Silica is a New York Stock Exchange-listed $643 million revenue producer and distributor of commercial silica through two segments. Two-thirds of its revenues are derived from the oil and gas prop and segment, and in essence, think of it as sand to prop and maintain fractured openings in oil and gas fracking applications. One-third of its revenues is derived from industrial and specialty products for glassmaking, building products, filtration, and chemical applications, to name a few. He'll share advice, best practices, and lessons learned from the IPO. For more information on Brian Shen, U.S. Silica, the Leadership Lyceum, Golden Gate Capital, please see the reverse side of this album cover, where we'll have various important links for you to follow. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with Brian Shen, CEO of U.S. Silicon. Welcome to this discussion, Brian. Thanks, Tom. I wanted to talk about coming in as SVP of sales and marketing first and your transition into CEO. Was it preordained that you would be CEO someday, or did you go through a process to uh, become CEO? So it, uh, it really wasn't preordained. Um, it, it's interesting that Golden Gate Capital uh, folks bought our, our company with the vision to, to transform us away from some of the traditional end-use markets that we had uh, established over more than a century, so the company had been around for a long time, and they saw the coming boom in uh, oil and gas with these uh, hydraulic fracturing applications, mm-hmm. and the type of products we make, the specialty sand is a big part of that, and we didn't sell much into oil and gas at the time, and so they had a vision to transform the company into a much heavier um, sales presence in, in oil and gas, and so they uh, they brought me in. I was a, actually the first external hire that they made after they acquired the company, and uh, what they really asked me to do was to put together the vision and the processes and to try and drive the company towards that uh, uh, towards that goal of, of making the transformation. Who owned it prior to Golden Gate? Was it a family-owned company? No, it, it, had, a, it had a series of owners over a few years. Um, of course, the, I think the, the owners who sold it um, to Golden Gate were kicking themselves later because of the valuation of the company went up by about 10x through the IPO process. Uh, I think uh, they were wishing they'd held on to it. And your development as CEO then, did they do anything in particular to prepare you for CEO during your sales and marketing leadership? So, so I think as, as I started out in, in sales and marketing, it was 
It was really more than that. I was responsible for the commercial activities of, of the company. They gave me a, a lot of room to make changes and to do things. And so one of the first things I did was come in and establish an oil and gas division. We didn't have that in the company. We had to start recruiting people. Um, we also, I would say kind of the seminal event in the history of the company was an all-hands meeting that we had about six months after I got there. So we got all of the top leaders of the company together and laid out this vision that we were going to transform the company into something substantially different. It's the first time we'd done this in a long time, and uh, basically this is kind of a staid you know, mining company, very conservative, you know, hadn't had much growth, a kind of flat line uh, in terms of earnings for many years. And I put up a vision to say that we're going to double the size of the company from an earnings standpoint in, in three years. And I just looked around the room to, to sort of silence and faces that were just kind of looking at me like I'd come from another planet, quite honestly. Um, and I think what's really cool is that at the end of the day, we said we're, new, we're going to do that in three years. We're able to do it in two years. And achieving that, I think, really set us on the path that we've continued on for the last few years here. It, it generated something that, in my experience, is really important, the ability to, to believe that we could do it. So we created that, that kind of positive energy and, and that um, reason to believe. And, and uh, you know, from there, the, the team was able to just, just take off. And so back to your question around the, the CEO, I think I, I kind of learned on the job. I, I took um, the opportunity that I had and, and just sort of ran with it. And nobody told me to stop, so I just kept on going. And I think when... Uh, the board and, and the private equity firm saw the kind of results that we were getting that led to uh, my promotion to president. And then I was sort of the obvious choice to become the, uh, the CEO as, as we went public, given that I was the one who was responsible for the strategy. They felt like I could do the best job of representing the company to investors um, and explaining to them what we were going to do, how we would continue to grow, uh, and uh, to kind of get the message out there. That must have been fascinating going from scratch with the oil and gas business at the time. How did you go about doing that? I mean, it, it truly is an entrepreneurial endeavor to build it from zero to, to what you did with that. Yeah, so um, you know, we started out with the, the bedrock being the people that we brought in. So we recruited in a lot of top talent. And uh, you know, quite honestly, 90% of the success that we've had as a company, I think, has been because of, of the folks that we brought in. We, in addition to creating the oil and gas division, we essentially replaced all the senior management in, in the team, or in some cases, brought in a level on top of the existing management who had the sort of capabilities that, that we would need. And, you know, it's, it's no negative around the, the folks who were there. They just w were the kind of folks that had a set of capabilities that were more focused at small, private company. And now, mm -hmm. You know, if you have an aspiration to be a public company and, and in a much higher growth mode and uh, just took a lot of additional skills that, that we didn't have within the company. So I think bringing those folks in was, was really the um, most important part of the, uh, of the transformation, quite honestly. It's impressive the degree to which Brian and U.S. Silica moved the organizational chess pieces to attack the new strategy and the eventual IPO. We'll continue along this line after this quick break. We're back with Brian Shin, CEO of U.S. Silica. Talk about the transformation a little bit, because I'm sure there's a cultural aspect to, to that. You've got people coming in from a, a different industry that probably had a different approach and maybe a different mindset. How did you establish a, a U.S. Silica culture? We spent a lot of time thinking about that. And the interesting thing is, as, as we would recruit folks um, over into uh, top roles, like our chief commercial officer, our vice president of strategy, et cetera, uh, everyone that we we found, uh, they came from from um, really strong companies. But I think if you talk to them today, they, they would tell you that they were dissatisfied in some way with the culture at their existing company. And when we would have the interviews, I would ask them about that, and they would always tell me some version of, "Gee, if, if I get the chance to to kind of run my own shop in a smaller company, um, here are the mistakes that that I won't make. Here are the things that that I'll do." So. Um, we sort of work together to, to establish a culture. And I think there's um, kind of five, five tenets to that. The first is we were a high-achieving company and certainly being owned by private equity, that the clock speed is pretty fast. Um, you have to move fast. You have to make decisions quickly. 
And so we looked for folks who, who were high achievers and had high aspirations. Uh, we also wanted a collegial environment. Uh, if you walk down the halls of U.S. Silica, you hear people laughing and having a good time, enjoying each other as, as colleagues. Uh, so that was the, the second thing that we wanted. I think the third, and this is, a, is one that everybody agreed on unanimously, is we wanted a low political culture, no, no, no politics. And we've done a really good job at, at not letting that into, uh, into the system. We also wanted an environment, kind of number four, of let's move fast, let's fix mistakes. I know people say that a lot, but they don't necessarily mean it. And so we're very careful around how we, how we treated um, teams and individuals when mistakes got made that, that we, we looked past that and, and we just decided to uh, focus on how do we how do we get things fixed and then I guess the, the last piece which underlies all this which I think is really important is we were going to be uncompromising on core values and we talk about core values uh, safety health environmental performance uh, ethics compliance and, and most importantly uh, how we treat each other as colleagues so we wanted this sort of fast-moving, high-energy, high-achieving, but respectful environment. And um, I think we've done a pretty good job at hitting the target on that. Going to low political culture, because that's a tough one to manage. Are, are there instances, Brian, where you've been on the front line ensuring that politics aren't being played and gotten in the way? And is there an example you can share of setting the example that way? So, it, you know, it, it starts at the top, obviously, like a, a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And um, I think there's things that happen all the time, sort of in real time, that, that the organization is watching you know, the CEO and, and the top leaders, how do they interact with each other, right? Um, I would say we did a pretty good job as we brought new talent in in screening out people, but we weren't perfect, and we've hired a lot of people over the last few years as the company has grown, and there were one or two that, that kind of slipped through uh, and brought some of those, those uh, politics in. And quite honestly, I didn't have to do anything. The culture just sort of crushed them. I mean, the culture would not tolerated and um, I, I didn't have to terminate people that they decided to leave themselves because they just you know, their colleagues just wouldn't tolerate uh, that, that kind of activity and so to me that, that's when you get to be self-sustaining mm-hmm. when it's not sort of management as an enforcer but the organization enforces those those cultural norms and it's interesting one, one of our new board members um, came um, a couple of years ago as he joined the board he said look I, I want to come to the office and just sort of meet people and walk around and uh, He's got a PhD in uh, organizational design. He's a you know got a, a strong HR background in addition to other things. And I, I said, look, just go and talk to people, wander around. And he came back to my office and said, wow, I can just get a sense for the culture that you've built here. And it's one of the things that I really like about U.S. Silica. And um, I love those kind of things because when uh, outsiders come in and say, wow. I, you know, I'm pretty good at, at sensing things, and as I walked around and talked to people, there was an openness. There wasn't uh, the usual sort of kind of hierarchical, um, you know, kind of uh, norms that, that you might uh, might find elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And it's actually one of the other things that we've done is that we, we have open door policy. Um, I don't restrict access to the board members. They can call up anybody in management and, and vice versa. Interesting. Uh, so we have a free flow of, of information, no, no restrictions. Do the board members take advantage of that? They do. That's really fascinating because you often hear that's very scripted, that interaction, and very purposeful in terms of the interaction. Yeah, you know, we've taken a different approach in interactions with our board, and so I think it starts with those of us who interact, interact with them all the time, myself and the senior leadership team. Uh, when we have a presentation to make or there's a project or a program, um, we just have sort of a full open book and full transparency. We, we talk about the things that are positive and the things that you know are perhaps on the other side of the ledger and some of the risks and uncertainties and uh, that culture is just kind of pervaded throughout throughout the company and that's why really I you know I have no problem with anybody calling up anybody and talking about these things because there's no there's nothing to hide right mm-hmm. as you said there was no scripting there's no spin it just it is what it is and uh, they'll hear from anybody in the organization I think you know, pretty much the same version that they heard from myself or you know, one of my high-level officers in the company. So, you know, there really is no spin. It just it is what it is, and we want to get the best information out to everybody so mm-hmm. we can, can make the right decision. That's very reflective of your trust in, in your employees, your people, your, your direct reports. You hold them in very high regard and a lot of trust there. Well, it's, it's back to your question before around how do you create this kind of low political culture. I think it... Um, 
you know, to me, it's it's kind of hypocritical if, on one hand, we say we're, we're going to have a, a very transparent culture, but then uh, folks see us, you know, spinning things either to the board or to investors. And we've taken the same approach with investors. We're very transparent to, to the degree we can be. Obviously, some things are sensitive, and we you know we can't talk about some levels of detail, but. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons we have a, a strong reputation on, on the street is that people know if they hear something from us, it's it's our best view of, of reality. Do you see that spilling over to your business opportunities and your commercial relationships with your customers? I, I think it does, uh, particularly the kind of environment we're in today where uh, we're looking to help consolidate our, our industry, mm-hmm. given that we've got what we think is the, is the best balance sheet in the industry and a lot of other uh, sort of attractive reasons why we would likely be the consolidate tour. Uh, we've had a lot of, of people that we've talked to in the M&A world, for example, tell us w- we've looked around and looked at the other companies in the space, and you know, U.S. Silica seems to be the honest broker here, the ones that we'd really like to um, like to perhaps do a, do a deal with or become part of or you know, even if we're thinking about um, doing a deal that requires equity, which we frequently have those discussions, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the other side has to think about who, whose equity do I want, who do I trust, and, and I think that that reputation it, it's, it just permeates everything. It's mm-hmm. not just internal, but it, it goes external as well. It goes to customers, um, and so t- to me, there's you know, there's there's only one one way to do it, and that's be 100 percent transparent and and open. The currency for acquisition deserves some reflection. Companies that accept stock for their purchase share both the value and risks with the company whose stock they accept for the transaction. This brings layers of complexity to a transaction's requirements, including the need for valuation of the acquirer, assessment of synergies of the combination, and the risk of their realization. The acquired company has to look at market risk between announcement and closing, which may get special interest in U.S. Silica's case with the volatility in the oil and gas market. And last but not least, and one that gets shorter attention in our view with respect to stock in lieu of cash transactions, it's the quality of the acquirer's leadership and management, which Brian describes in detail. Let's take a break and come back and dig into the IPO experience. Back with Brian Shin, CEO of U.S. Silica. Let's talk about the IPO. And Brian, it's the experience you had with that, but also advice for people that may be in a private equity ownership situation right now and they're thinking about that on the horizon. Often people are facing that prospect for the first time. What are some of the big notables and and lessons learned from the IPO preparedness and going through it? You know, if I had to choose a word Mm -hmm. to describe the IPO process, I would say intense. It was a very intense process, and um, I would say we probably underestimated, and my guess is most companies underestimate the challenge involved in in that. It's a a massive exercise, and, you know, just to give you a feel for it, the, the final report that we prepared to file was 842 pages long. Oh, gosh. And I kept a copy of it on my desk for a long time just to remind myself <laughs> kind of what it took to get through this process. And you know, imagine um, just for months on end, you know, you're working with your lawyers, your advisors, uh, all kinds of other folks. You know, and, and I mean, literally, we went over every word on every page, mm-hmm. right? So we put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that. So one of the pieces of advice I would have is don't spend as much time sweating every every word. We probably spent too much time uh, doing doing that for sure. Um, you know, obviously on the uh, aspect of becoming a public company, uh, we were pretty strong already on a lot of the core value areas, and uh, I think we, we did a, a really good job as a private company uh, on things like audits and compliance, but it's a whole other level when you become public, and I think you look at Sarbanes-Oxley and, and the kind of demands that are placed upon you as a public company, it's not enough just to do the right things. Now you have to prove that you can do the right things. You have to have the documentation and uh, some very specific requirements that have come out of you know, Dodd-Frank and, and much of the other legislation that's mm-hmm. out there. So um, we, I think, again, underestimated the amount of work that was going to be required there. And, and so we had to beef up our, our finance department where a lot of that kind of extra work resides. Uh, and actually, we uh, we started out with external auditors to help us, but 
we've actually brought a lot of that internal now, which is, is fantastic, and that's worked out really well. So uh, I would just, just another tip is think about the kind of staffing and, and your hiring plan in terms of the uh, the, the finance team and the uh, and the audit team. And there, Brian, were you looking just for public company experience, or were you looking for actually the transaction experience from those individuals having gone through an IPO? So a lot of it was was certainly public company experience. Mm-hmm. You sort of know what you need to do, but but when you really get into it and, and see the level of work and the detail that's involved, you almost can't believe it. So I think it's why a lot of people at the end of end of the day perhaps decide not to go public just because it's it's adds you know so many uh, additional additional burdens. I guess the other thing around big difference between private and, and public is is just the intensity around the quarterly rhythm. We had a quarterly rhythm as a company already, but um, it's taken up a couple levels when, when you've got these very specific things you have to do, you know, around filings and earnings calls, and um, it, it just takes it up to, to a whole other level. And so I think we've re- refined that over time. I, I look back you know, after three years as a public company and realized that you know, we weren't as sophisticated as I might have liked mm-hmm. out of the gate, but we got better, and now I think we, we do a really good job at that, but there's lots of sort of subtleties of that uh, along the way that you don't appreciate until you're, you're right in that. Under the private equity ownership, were there some good practices that uh, you applied then that, that gave you certain disciplines under public company ownership? So if I think back about our, our private equity owners at Golden Gate Capital, uh, they were they're just fantastic owners, and, and I know that sometimes private equity gets a, a bad name, and uh, I suppose there's a, a spectrum of, of, of different um, you know funds out there. But uh, the Golden Gate guys were, were just first class uh, in in every regard, and I would say the certainly one of the things that, that they brought to us was speed, and so that was helpful. But specifically as as a public company, I think they. Um, helped us with a level of discipline and scrutiny of investment decisions that um, has carried through to, to today. So uh, j- just the way they would look at things and, and um, being able to, to get their take on, on various ideas and thoughts, uh, it was probably much more aligned with how uh, the Wall Street investors might think about it mm-hmm. as opposed to how we might think about it as sort of internal within the company. So I think that, that helped us grow faster in terms of being able to to think a bit more like investors, and uh, that's obviously important given that you know the investors are uh, quite an important stakeholder once you become public. How was their approach to discipline and scrutiny, and the way that they did it? How does that differ from maybe that stereotype of private equity? You hear all kinds of stories about private equity. I just I've never had another experience with private mm-hmm. equity, so I can't speak you know directly from firsthand experience. But what I can say is that. Uh, Whenever we put forward plans, had ideas, wanted to make investments, uh, we always got great support from from Golden Gate. They were always right behind us. Obviously, we would, we would have robust discussions, and you know some of their ideas and thoughts would, would kind of meld into our own. And but at the end of the day, um, we invested you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on their watch, and mm-hmm. and that they could have done what perhaps you know private equity is accused of all the time, which is oh, just taking cost out and sort of milking the business. But they took a different approach. Uh, their thought was to, to grow the business and make it more valuable. Um, of course, I, you know, I don't believe for a minute that if we didn't come forward with, with quality plans that we would have gotten approval and support. But I think our team did a really good job of, of putting together the thoughts and ideas and the plans. And uh, when we bring them forward, we got support to, to spend uh, and invest quite a lot of, uh, of capital. Back to the IPO and that experience, what do you look back on? What really stands out to you maybe as a shining moment? The IPO itself, w- when you get out and launch, it's a pretty intense experience. And you, you, For me, you, know, you start to get your first taste of what it's really like to be a public company CEO. Um, the, the, the road show that we went on, the so-called road show, which is basically a two-week nonstop uh, trip of, of visiting 10 to 15 investors a day, uh, standing up in front of groups of one, two, 300 investors, you know, people with lots of questions. And, and, and so it's a bit of a trial by, by fire. So mm-hmm. I think my probably most vivid memory is just, just the intensity of that. And uh, at the end of the first week, literally, um, my voice was gone. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't speak. And the reality of it is that even though we had a team of people that uh, was making the, the visits on, on investors and calling on them, um, the only people that the only person they really wanted to hear from was me, right? Yeah. So every every question was directed at me. So you're sort of the, 
the person on the spot and you're expected to know the answers more or less to everything, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's an 842-page document with, with quite a few uh, thoughts and ideas in there, right? And so you have investors, really smart people. Uh, they have all kinds of other permutations and ideas and questions. And so you have to be able to, uh, to think on your feet. And I remember uh, the Golden Gate guys, of course, are located in San Francisco. And as part of the, the road show, we were out on the, uh, the West Coast. And uh, the, we had lunch with the Golden Gate folks and the, uh, the, the principal out there, the one gentleman we've been working with, you know, when we came in, because he'd been getting sort of good returns back from the investment community and things, so he came in and he hugged me. He said, this is the first time I've ever hugged a, a CEO, right? <laughs> so uh, there are a few memories like that, because he's not a guy who would usually hug anybody, at least not in the business world. But it was it was an interesting time, uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of intensity, but uh, you know, a lot of satisfaction, too, when you finally reach the, the finish line and you know the order book is, is full and, and you get out and... Uh, Kind of launched the ship as a as a public company. Who was your investment bank? Who was leading you through? All so uh, Morgan Stanley mm-hmm. was the uh, the lead uh, on the left of our deal, and uh, Bank of America was was on the right. And then we had a syndicate of uh, another five to seven uh, banks. So we had a pretty pretty good size uh, syndicate that uh, that helped us with this. And it's interesting, you know, we've maintained uh, really good relationships with. Uh, the uh, the banks that have helped us there and uh, they, they've done a lot for us in in subsequent deals and, and other work that uh, that we're doing there was a, I think it was an institutional investor article on you Brian and and that experience and I think you mentioned in there that you drew a lot on your sales background to speak to the investors what else did you draw on? did you have some specific communications training what did you do to prepare yourself for the roadshow itself at the end of the day we spent a lot of time obviously thinking about questions what are ways that we might want to answer those questions but once you get get past all that it, it it's just kind of one by one, you know, t- take the meetings as they come and uh, recognize that you're going to get all kinds of different questions and you have to think on your feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's why you, know, you think about who do you want out there as your point person. You know, I felt pretty comfortable because I- I'd been there from the start, from the start of this transformation, and I felt like there really wasn't much that people could ask me that I didn't have a, a good answer for. Or, you know, but it's also easier too when you don't have to spin anything when you just are telling the truth, right? Mm-hmm. So, especially as I get older, I'm not smart enough to remember <laughs> what I told the other person, right. and, and you know, how, how do you spin this? You just, you know, you tell everybody the same story and answer the questions the same way. And uh, it was interesting, though. Uh, we got a lot of advice as we went on these, you know, investor meetings from the investors themselves and mm-hmm. saying, "Look, as a as a CEO or as a company, you know, do this, don't do that." Don't be like this company. You know, the CEO is never accessible. Whenever there's bad news, that person hides and doesn't come out on the street. And so, I, I, I took a lot of um, advice. And so, to me, another sort of best practice. You know, in every meeting I had, I, I'd ask the investors, well, "What advice do you have for us?" I think that uh, was very helpful to me. And you know, sometimes you get things that are more helpful than, than others. But um, we've continued that that practice, listening to investors and asking for their their input is is important. And there have been times where you know we really weighed that uh, that advice heavily, and, and it's factored into our decisions. I frequently remind my colleagues that uh, people have invested two to three billion dollars in in our company, right? And, and I think it's all too easy to see it as a maybe a faceless you know fund like a Fidelity or something like that. But behind that are people like you and me, mm-hmm. and, and folks that have invested their retirement savings, their, their college tuition, you know, for, for their children. Uh, their nest egg, you know, so it, it kind of brings it home. It's not this sort of monolithic Wall Street. There's individuals who've invested their money, and uh, you know they're, they're counting on us to, to do a good job. And I think, uh, at least for me anyway, that always brings home the seriousness of what we have to do and, and the responsibility that, that we have to uh, to our investors. Were there things that you'd do differently in the IPO? Were there some areas that you would have changed, improved upon? We were fairly new to, to all this, obviously, um, and none of us on the leadership team had, had ever done this. And we had our private equity you know, backers who, who had some experience in this, but um, to the scale that we did it, this was the biggest, you know, biggest venture that they had ever taken public. So I think I would probably, if I had to do it over again, um, I would have uh, seeked out counsel from folks who, who've been through it and uh, people like you know, like myself now, who, who have all these experiences, and say, "Wow, here are things that I do differently," or ask these questions, or make sure you handle this that that way, or just practical things around how you how you deal with 
um, how you deal with the whole process. Uh, so I think going out and seeking uh, seeking advice from others is probably uh, you know, one thing that I would have done differently. We did some of that, but um, you know, building that network and you know, you, you know, we're talking earlier about having this kind of you know peer to peer network where you can share right. information and, and uh, you know, folks you can call on for advice. And I, I had some good advisors. Our, our chairman uh, has uh, has done a number of, of uh, public company CEO roles, and so he was a he was a great help and and, and others. But um, you can never get too much of that. That's one thing that I'd think about doing differently. Fitting last points on seeking out the wisdom of those who have been through a situation before which actually underscores the purpose of this show, a CEO's virtual mentor. If you'd like to ask specific questions about the IPO, please send them to my email at linquist, L-I-N-Q-U-I-S-T, at leadershiplyceum.com, and I'll get them answered in follow-up discussions. There's a link to the email on the back of the album cover in iTunes. Keep your eyes out for the conclusion of the interview with Brian Shin coming up in Part 2 in the coming days. Part two will focus on his leadership and priorities as CEO, which he'll describe in great detail as constantly balancing the needs of stakeholders. Come back and see us. The Leadership Lyceum, a CEO's virtual mentor, has been a production of Dinosaur Productions, LLC. Copyright 2016. All rights reserved. Come back and listen. It's lonely at the top. (laughs) 